wrote her dissertation uh, on free will and moral responsibility, defending a kind of neo-Kantian compatibilism, and continued to publish mostly on free will and moral responsibility during her postdoc years. Since moving to Umea in 2018, she has focused more on philosophical issues related to uh, psychiatry and madness, often drawing on her own experiences. For instance, she has published on madness and moral responsibility in her 2022 paper, Exemption, Self-Exemption and Compassionate Self-Excuse, originally published in International Math Studies Journal and forthcoming as a chapter in the Bloomsbury Guide to Philosophy of Disability. She has dealt with madness and epistemology in her 2022 paper, Radical Psychotic Doubt and Epistemology for Philosophical Psychology. This talk draws mostly on strategy, Peronian skepticism, and the allure of madness, co-authored with Paul Lodge and forthcoming in the European Journal of Analytic Philosophy, and a wide enough range of test environments for psychiatric disabilities, recently published in Cambridge University Press, Royal Institute of Philosophy Supplement, Volume 94, Lived Experience and Co-Production in Philosophy and Mental Health. The title today is Why Would I Want to Stay in This World? The Impact of the Environment on Severity, Management, and Motivation. Sophia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen with you now. Uh, so here we go. Uh, so I realized uh, pretty recently that it sounds like this talk might be about suicide. If you don't read the abstract, but just read the title, it's actually not about suicide, but it's about madness. And it's going to be more focus on the motivation part than the other parts. Uh, why would I want to stay in this world? The impact of the environment on severity management and motivation. So. Uh, so I'm, uh, I said, bringing together two themes, I guess, in the abstract. Now I'm saying three themes because I realized that that's more accurate. Um, so three themes from my writing. First, the impact of external environmental fact factors on neurodivergence and madness. The importance of nuance when discussing agency, choice, and responsibility. And uh, the allure of madness, even the prima facie terrifying kind. Uh, so the importance of external environment is often brought up in discussions of neurodivergencies like autism and ADHD. Uh, and I'm thinking now on like popular writings, um, social media, magazine articles, newspaper articles, um, probably academic writings too, or I mean, it's it's definitely an academic writings too, but you see a lot of popular pieces on how the external environment is very important for neurodivergent people if they're gonna be able to flourish um, or just more production focused if they're gonna be productive in the workplace, uh, be able to do well in school and so on. But often the focus is on pretty small, and local and fairly cheap adjustments. I mean, for obvious reasons, that's where the focus often ends up. Uh, the kind of small local and fairly cheap adjustments that people often are entitled to demand under various legislations in different countries, uh, like in the US, that would be the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so, for instance, you might uh, be entitled, legally entitled to demand a quieter workplace, uh, like better lightning, if you're sensitive to glaring lights, uh, maybe being allowed to work from home a couple of days a week, uh, depending on your job. Obviously, if it's like an office job that you can uh, do from home a couple of days, not today, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so I have written about how uh, first it's a mistake to think that the environment only matters for like mild conditions, uh, like common cases of autism and ADHD are often perceived to be, uh, but like cease to matter if we go into serious mental disorders, because then you really have a messed up brain and it doesn't matter which environment you're in. Um, this is a mistake 
And it's also a mistake to be so narrowly focused on things like lightning or noise levels. Uh, because obviously one's whole environment and one's whole life situation matters too. Uh, so, I mean, there is lots of research. I don't, I just don't think that it's sufficiently well known among like the general public, uh, among politicians, among other people in power who claim that they want to do something uh, about mental health and improve mental health in the population or in a company or whatever. But there is a lot of research on both of individual trauma and abuse, but also structural problems like racism and poverty. Um, I didn't mention homelessness, but obviously uh, having very stressful jobs are important risk factors for developing many conditions in the first place even so-called serious mental disorders, and also that these things may cause relapses. Um, but so environment matters, not just local little things like lightning, but your entire situation and uh, in an even wider sense, the entire society in which you live matters for mental health. And it does so so to speak across the spectrum uh, from conditions usually considered mild or not considered disorders at all, just neurodivergences all across the board to stuff considered serious mental disorders, it matters. Um, it matters for whether you break out in, well, do you say that in English, break out in? Uh, yeah, whether you get something like schizophrenia in the first place, it matters for like relapses into florid psychosis. Um, and it matters in several ways. And one way it matters is that it affects how motivated you are to try to stay anchored to this world. And in my writings, I speak about the mainstream world, like the general normal world that most people inhabit and take for granted, so to speak. Uh, and uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus more on the motivation part, which I think, so when it comes to how a bad environment, let's like put a bad environment as an umbrella term for all these problems, uh, for stuff like uh, abuse within the family uh, and uh, big societal problems like poverty or a super stressful job market. Let's just call all of that bad environment for the sake of simplicity. Um, there is a lot of research on how that matters uh, because it might increase the risk that you get the condition in the first place. It, it might increase the risk for relapses. Uh, and just make the condition more severe than it needed to be once you have it. There's a lot of research on this, even though I think it's not sufficiently well known among the general public. So um, obviously researchers in this field know it, but it's not sufficiently known in general, I think, but it is there. But when it comes to the motivation aspect, I think that is really not sufficiently written about at all, not even in academia, in uh, peer-reviewed journals among researchers. Uh, so, but before moving on and talking about motivation, I'm gonna talk a bit about agency, choice, and moral responsibility. Uh, because obviously, when it comes to stuff that you have no control over, motivation becomes irrelevant. It, if I have like, type one diabetes, it doesn't matter if I feel like very motivated to produce insulin internally in my body because I'm still not gonna do it. So I still need to get the shots um, because this is something you have no control over. And a lot of people kind of wanna describe mental issues as if they were as out of control as whether my pancreas produce insulin or like shuts down that part. Um, because there is this idea that uh, 
otherwise you'll have to like resent and blame mad people uh, and uh, recently uh, i was a guest in a swedish radio show uh about where they did an episode on free will uh, so I was there kind of in my capacity of a free will expert, not in my capacity of a philosophy of psychiatry expert or anything. Um, but another guest was a psychiatrist and he started talking about how important it is to realize uh, that people with ADHD, for instance, they mess up because their brains are weird and they have no control over it. And he gave like some other examples that came back to ADHD. And it's very important to realize uh, so we don't blame them. And there is like this idea that there is a dichotomy between blaming and being angry with people or going, they have no control, it's just the brain. But this is such a false dichotomy because when sane people interact with each other, uh, they very often realize that there are more options than just blame and resentment. Sorry, blame and not resentment. I, I should have proofread these slides better. I'm sorry, I have to bear with this. Uh, there are probably going to be typos on several slides coming up now since they are in the first ones. Uh, but anyway, people often realize that there are more options than just, on the one hand, blame and resentment, and on the other hand, regard the other as completely out of control and completely exempt from responsibility for suboptimal choices, self-destructive behavior, and so on. Um, people often find reasons to adopt a third option of say empathy and understanding uh, and like put themselves in the other person's shoes and go, yeah, it was tough for you and so on. Uh, so the idea that there is this dichotomy between on the one hand getting pissed off and angrily blame people and on the other hand go you had no control it was just your brain that kind of only comes up uh, when discussing psychiatric issues but we have to get away from this false dichotomy there too um, because well first of all just because it's false this is not the only two ways you can respond to people who make uh somehow suboptimal or destructive choices. It's just false that you have to choose between these two options, getting angry or going, you had no control, you could not help it. Uh, but it's also simply false for lots of mad people that we had no control whatsoever over going full mad or going into a state of florid psychosis. Um, and when people have at least some control and some choice in the matter, then motivation matters. It matters how motivated you are uh, to stay anchored to this world, to the mainstream world, to stay at least semi-sane. How motivated you are matters for whether you're going to succeed in doing so or not. It's not the only thing that matters, but it's one of the things that matter. Uh, so first, so this might be least controversial when we discuss indirect ways to affect your madness slash sanity. Uh, so for instance, you might be more or less motivated to take medication uh, that decreases the risk that you'll have a relapse into florid psychosis. Uh, and uh, first, if you have negative side effects from them, you need a stronger motivation to stay sane to nevertheless take them unless you're caused to do so. I'm assuming like you're an outpatient and no one is actually forcing the pills into you. Um, but also just generally keeping good routines, being conscientious, it does take a lot of motivation um, maintaining a decent sleep schedule is often important and something that clinicians stress, uh, but that can require quite a lot of motivation. Uh, like maybe you hang out with friends and they want to stay up late for whatever reason, or you're going to go like, no, I have to go, go home and sleep for the sake of my mental health. You're going to be motivated to do that. Um, 
just maintaining good routines in general, like eating well and exercising, all that stuff we know is good for general health and also good for mental health. So avoid stressful situations that might trigger an outbreak. Even when such stressful situations are prima facie fun uh, and slash or something that everyone else engages in, if you're going to avoid that, to avoid the stress that you know can be detrimental, you need to be very motivated. Uh, and same people know full well that the above is hard and requires motivation. Um, but um, people might not appreciate sufficiently that this is hard and requires a lot of motivation when we move to psychiatric patients. It's often assumed, for instance, that if people skip the medication, people immediately jump to the conclusion that, oh, it's lack of insight. Uh, instead of considering that, I, I mean, it can be, I have myself in the past quit my antipsychotics multiple times because I thought, surely I'm cured now. I don't need those anymore. And that was kind of irrational, but uh, I mean, people also quit the medications or do other things that uh, they know beforehand are risk factors for a relapse for just the same ordinary weakness of will reasons that you know sane people fail at the new year's resolutions and stuff and you might need just to be very motivated to stay on the path with all these indirect methods but now i'm getting into stuff that's probably more controversial uh but that there can also be more of a direct choice here uh, so full-blown psychosis has traditionally been considered something that just falls over a person. And uh, even if you have these indirect methods, like taking your pills most obviously, but also maintaining your sleep schedule, et cetera, et cetera, to like, lower the risk of relapse as much as possible, whether you ultimately relapse or not. It's not something you directly control. Uh, but research by Neb Jones and others, this is fairly recent research from like 2016 and later, complicates this picture. So uh, Jones and some other researchers did these uh, interview studies with psychosis patients. Uh, well, it turns out that lots of them talk about choosing to let go of sanity and choosing to go psychotic. And a lot of them also thought that they were quite unique in this and that everyone else just have it like falling over them uh, with no choice or control at all. Uh, and I have been using this metaphor in both writing and in talks uh, that it can feel like there's a rapid river pulling at me. And I'm like barely hanging on by a tree branch, but it's very, very hard. You feel like the lactic acid burning up uh, and the river's pull is strong, but there is still this element of either choosing to hold on for dear life or thinking, oh, fuck this, it's too hard and let go. Um, and a mad friend of mine said that for her, the choice is even more more controlled, uh, she said, it's like seeing a door and it's like, it's the door to madness. And I can just open the door and step in and go mad. Um, so we've got these different metaphors and uh, yeah, so I'm not saying this is universal. I'm not saying we should go from a view where psychosis patients are universally regarded as having no control whatsoever, psychosis just comes over you, to a view where everyone has some kind of a choice, like the river or the door, something like this. Uh, because I think for basically all psychiatric patient groups, you'll find that within each diagnosis, there's a pretty heterogeneous bunch. Um, but uh, Jones and others, their studies at least indicate that this might not be super unusual. Maybe it's uh, fairly common even. And uh, yeah, then you also um, need to be motivated 
not to let go of the tree branch or not to step through the door. And if you're not sufficiently motivated yet, uh, if you're not sufficiently motivated to stick with the mainstream world, you're gonna let go or you're gonna open the door. And obviously how motivated you are to stay in this world will depend on how good your life in this world is. So in that way, the environment will matter in a kind of a more direct way, I think, than is usually acknowledged. Uh, now, I really want to stress something here that madness as an escape doesn't imply that madness means total oblivion. Uh, and I think this is an important caveat because there is this old prejudice that's still alive. It's not like it's completely gone from people's uh, minds from people's systems of belief that if you go mad, if you go into a state of like florid psychosis, and basically if you go in a state where you seem really weird to other people and they can't talk to you or communicate anymore because uh, you just can't reach each other, then it also means that you no longer experience other people or experience your surroundings. It means that you won't notice if, for instance, you're locked up in horrible condi conditions or if you're abused. Um, so, I mean, it's important to stress that this is not the case. Uh, so in a paper, I refer to Janet Frames, Faces in the Water, a New Zealand author who spent a lot of time in mental institutions in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, and so when she first became a mental hospital patient, um, she was in, uh, in a part of the psychiatric hospital for sort of less serious patients. Uh, and then there was another wing of the building or maybe another building altogether of the hospital uh, where the really bad cases were kept in really crappy conditions. And then she was told that this is not a problem because they're completely mad. So they don't even notice what the surroundings are like or how they are treated. And at first she ac accepted that, but then her own condition deteriorated and she was moved over there. And uh, turns out this actually wasn't true. And it was actually a horribly shitty experience to be there, mad or not. Uh, but uh, even so, uh, even though madness doesn't make you completely oblivious of your surroundings, it can still function as a kind of escape from your current situation. Um, and I think this is not sufficiently written about, at least not in modern psychiatric literature. We've got uh, Edward Podvol's uh, The Seduction of Madness from, uh, I think it's from 1990. Um, and then some of uh, Justin Garson's historical examples in his 2022 book. Um, but uh, I think in uh, present psychiatric literature, at least what I'm familiar with, it's not much talked about. Uh, I may be wrong. I was after this year and he's a psychiatrist, so you might correct me. For instance, there might be other psychiatrists here who could correct me. Um, but yeah, anyway, madness, not as total oblivion uh, of your surroundings or your situation, but still as a kind of escape. Because in addition to adding things like hallucinations and illusions, uh, madness can provide a very different focus and a very different spin on things that happen. Um, so it might be easiest to see that it can be tempting to let go of the mainstream world and just slide into madness when we look at certain kinds of like grand or cool madness. Um, so some people maybe in particular uh, bipolar people who get like manic psychosis um, may experience madness in a way where it's kind of easy to see why it's tempting. Like, whoa, I'm one with the cosmos. I'm gaining grand and important insights. It's uh, kind of like being high or being on fun party drugs. Um, but even when madness is terrifying and 
sort of very bad if taken in isolation. It can still be less bad than remaining in the mainstream world because everything is relative, you know. And uh, therefore it's very important what your mainstream world life is like for your motivation to stay there, not just what the madness is like. Is it cool and cosmic or terrifying, but also what your life here in this world is like. Um, so, but we cannot understand that people may be tempted even by terrifying madness and lack this strong motivation that everyone is supposed to have to remain in the mainstream world, unless we dare to acknowledge that the latter can be quite bad. And I think this is often a bit taboo to talk about. Um, everyone just wants to hang on to the assumption that obviously it's so much greater, it's so much better to be sane than to be mad and don't really wanna touch the matter that it might not always be. But we close ourselves off from the possibility of understanding a lot of mad people if we insist that the mainstream world is always so wonderful. Uh, and so this is something I talked with Paul Lodge a lot about when we worked on our paper. Uh, so gonna go back uh, momentarily. So when Paul talked about his psychosis and wrote about it, it really was this thing that, okay, obviously I haven't experienced it, um, but it sounded really cool when he talked about it. And so it was an understandable temptation to me when he talked about how uh, he had to come to terms with sort of being stuck in this world. But I said, from for my part, it's very different because I kind of slide into this terrifying hellish demon world. And obviously I don't want to be there because it's horrible. Uh, but when I thought more about it, I realized it also has its temptations. Uh, three temptations to be precise, which I'm listing here. Uh, so first, I've actually used this comparison <laughs> for many years that, you know, going full mad for me has usually been like being the main character in a horror movie. And that's bad, you know, you don't want to be in a horror movie. It would be nice, much nicer to be the main character in some other genre. I don't know, superhero story where you win the day at the end. But Still just being the main character has a certain allure, I think. Uh, rather than just being one of eight billion people, no more important than anyone else. And also the excitement of it, uh, because as frightening as it is to be chased by murderous demons, at least it's not boring. Because I mean, regular life, can be very tedious sometimes. And, and finally, it's the simplicity of it all. And I think this might be its most tempting aspect. It's like, well, they're out to kill me and I must stay alive. And I also have some idea of how to do that. I've built up quite a lot of magical thinking around this thing over the years. Um, but this regular mainstream world is incredibly complicated with lots of big, big problems that we can't really solve. Uh, or they might be solvable on some grand collective level, but as individuals, we're still pretty helpless. You know, we've got the climate crisis, the rise of fascism, all these things, and it might, in a way, feel easier to deal with some pursuers that are after just me, you know? And um, yeah, so I was at a conference in Barcelona this summer and talked to uh, another scholar called Keiso Bijana. Uh, and they had also experienced very terrifying psychosis and with like different content than mine, not the demons. And yeah, there were a lot of differences in the exact content 
but they kind of agreed on these three temptations, in particular, the simplicity aspect. Uh, and, and I made this joke that, you know, our subconscious come up with these extremely simple narratives of just enemies don't want to kill you and you get to try to escape and that's it. Uh, and I said, like, it's you got you got a little Michael Bay, you know, directing your psychosis. It's just this is the plot. It fits on a napkin. And then it's all like explosions and action. And then immediately after I said it, we both kind of felt bad about this because we don't want to have like the idea of having a little Michael Bay homunculus in your mind. It's not very nice, but, you know, there's something to it. You replace the huge sprawling complexity of the mainstream world with an extremely simple narrative. Uh, Rosa Rittenane, uh, English psychiatrist and researcher, uh, also wrote this paper, I think it was with Michael Broom, but uh, he was her patient. Um, a man that she calls Harry in the paper, it's not his real name. Um, but uh, yeah, he was paranoid and uh, lived in all these great conspiracies at which he was at the center. Um, and uh, uh, she asked him, how would you feel if you woke up and realized that this was all in your imagination one day? And he said, well, that would be awful. I would be terribly depressed just like everyone else because then I would be pointless like everyone else. I I'm just roughly quoting from memory, but that was the gist of it. Uh, so he didn't want to take medication and she thought, well, it's, it's probably correct that there's a high risk that he would get depressed for these reasons if he was forcibly medicated. So, you know, just let him remain at the center of all these great conspiracies rather than plunge him into depression. And uh, so a lot of the stuff he talked about was kind of prima facie scary, perhaps not as bad as my psychosis had been in like terms of horror movie factor, but still, you know, he had a lot of threats that he perceived, but he still said, I'm probably the happiest man in the world because I'm so important and I'm at the center of everything. Um, yeah, so, so I don't think, or I know that regardless of whether it's very common or rare, uh, this experience of mine that you may feel tempted to slide off into kind of a different mad world, even though it's terrifying, is, is not unique. Uh, and then you consider that lots of mad people have actually very bad lives in this world. Mad people are often isolated, often poor, often in bad physical health, often unemployed or doing pointless and boring jobs and so on. Uh, mad women often end up economically trapped in bad relationships that may or may not be outright abusive, but they may also be just plain bad, but you can't break up and leave because you have no income. You've like dropped out of the job market a long time ago. Mad men often end up very lonely. Uh, in some countries, homelessness is very common among the mad. Obviously, it's horribly shitty to be homeless. Um, but yet there is this common assumption in the mental health care system and among people in general that staying in the mainstream world is enormously better than going full mad. It's something everyone wants all the time. Of course, everyone is motivated to do what it takes to stay there. And then when people uh, still don't act as if they were motivated, it's like incomprehensible. It's lack of insight or something. Uh, so I'm going to give a concrete example here from my own life, which is fairly recent. So generally, my life now is very good. Uh, and I would not do as well as I do today if I did not have this very fulfilling and stable personal life, if I didn't have uh, financial security and job security, um, if I didn't have basically a pretty idyllic life in the mainstream world. Uh, I've had that for a few years now, and this is 
very strongly connected to the fact that I've improved so much uh, that I even manage off meds. Um, so yeah, but even so, I can feel that the world at large is kind of going down the toilet and it's scary and I can't do anything about it. And I can kind of miss the simplicity of just being threatened by demons sometimes. Uh, but yeah, generally uh, my personal life is very good, but then even in a generally good life, a sudden crisis might happen. Uh, so this is a uh, little Spock. It's a photo taken last year when he was still a puppy. He's uh, fully grown now. Um, but um, yeah, last early fall, uh, he was playing with uh, another dog. Uh, we have three dogs, two young ones, the two and one old, the two young ones were playing. Uh, and they were chasing each other at high speed this way and that over the beach. And the beach has a lot of driftwood, like you can see on the picture. And from the driftwood, sometimes sharp sticks poke out. Uh, and a little puppy Spock who did not yet have like the coordination and body control of an adult dog ran into a piece of driftwood and a sharp stick came right into one of his eyes. And I should say right away that he fully recovered so you don't have to like listen to me going on while worrying about what happened to this poor little dog you see here on the picture. But yeah, a sharp stick got jammed into his eye and he screamed and blood was streaming down his cheek. Um, and so I, I picked him up and I started running back home with the two other dogs in tow uh, and realized I had to take him to the vet and everything. But uh, I, I couldn't believe then that he would fully recover. His eye actually fully healed and he's got his sight um, on both eyes and everything. I, I couldn't believe it then when he was like screaming and blood coming out of his eye. Um, and it just struck me that it should be possible to rewind a bit the passage of time and avoid this whole thing or else step sideways to another time branch when this didn't happen. And uh, yeah. Uh, and so first I, uh, I felt this very strongly that this should be possible. I just have to step into this way of thinking and acknowledge the possibility and I can do it and it will be much better than just going to the vet and try to deal with everything through veterinary medicine. And, you know, another little part of my mind said, this is clearly a mad thought, you're kind of going mad now, but also that wouldn't be so bad because then I could just avoid, abandon all these pet related medical responsibilities and just lie in a bed, drag it up to here and just, take a break from the whole thing and that wouldn't be so bad either and i was extremely tempted to just you know hanging on the tree branch just releasing the grip and let go and uh, it required tons and tons of motivation to hang on and uh, what gave me the resolve here was mostly as i write here on the slide my responsibility is to husband and dogs. Um, and uh, and yeah, also uh, he was in a different city when this happened too. So uh, maybe that was crucial. If he had been at home, if it had been possible for him to take over, maybe I would have let go, but it was all on me, this responsibility. But at the same time, a caring responsibility, a kind of positive responsibility, not the kind of possibility, not the kind of responsibility which is just like another burden that you would like to shake off. Um, but uh, if my resolve hadn't been so strong, uh, I would have let go and I would have gone full mad again and uh, probably taking some time to recover and get back. And if my overall life situation 
had been worse, I don't doubt that then I wouldn't have have the resolve to hang on to the branch. Uh, so what are we supposed to do about this? Um, I've talked a little about the importance of motivation before with mental health staff in my teaching, because I have some teaching for psychiatric nurses, for instance, at university. And then they just felt pretty helpless about this because they were like, yeah, so many psychosis patients have really bad life situations. They live pretty bad lives in this world, but there isn't much I as a nurse can do about that. And uh, yeah, this is true. So I get that it was demoralizing to hear. So, you know, isolated people, if you get a good relationship with mental health staff, that's still something that can be very important to people and might, you know, brighten up their day. Um, but there's not really anything more that mental health staff can do, I think. Um, then try to build a good relationship. Uh, and same thing if your family or friends to someone whose life has fallen to pieces, you might not be able to do all that much for improving their entire life and their entire situation, just be a friend, but maybe that's not enough. So uh, I think it can be pretty demoralizing to acknowledge that motivation can matter so much and that motivation to a large degree, depends on how good your life is here in the mainstream world. But I think that recognizing and naming a problem is still better than just pretending that it doesn't exist. And it may at least contribute, I think, to increased empathy and understanding if we acknowledge that you often need a strong motivation to stay in the mainstream world in order to do so. And uh, you're not gonna be so strongly motivated if your life here is crap. Uh, and uh, that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.